Okay, um, the next is recorded by Michael Ed Mike Edmonds. Um, I don't think, again, without n not needing introduction, a diabetologist from uh, King's, um, a professor of the diabetic foot medicine there, and um, he set up his diabetic foot clinic in 1981. Um, as you know, he's received many awards, including the Carl Bucker Award, the, GF the FSG Award for Achievement, uh, the Edward Olmos Award, and he gave the Arnold Bloom Lecture uh, a number of years ago. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, a great honor to be uh, talking to you today at the Melbourne Foot Conference. Could I have uh, my first slide, please? And I'm talking on the clinical presentation and differential diagnosis of the acute Charcot foot. To understand the presentation, we need to review the natural history of the Charcot foot. Initially, there's a trauma, properly mild, which leads to the primary injury. And this results in uncontrolled inflammation for two reasons. One, the presence of neuropathy. Now we need our nerves to control inflammation, to turn it on and to turn it off. And in neuropathy, uh, we get uncontrolled inflammation. The other cause is related to the secondary trauma from continued ambulation because of the sensory neuropathy. And this uncontrolled inflammation constitutes the active acute Charcot foot. So what actually is the active Charcot foot? It's inflammation of the foot associated with non-specific combinations of damage to bones, joints, soft tissues. And this is an important initial stage in the natural history. From this initial stage, there are two main pathways in the natural history to amputation. On the left, the development of deformity, then ulceration, then infection, and then an infective necrosis and gangrene. On the right, to the development of deformity, which can be very severe and then prohibits walking. And this leads to the need of amputation. One thing I must stress particularly, the natural history often proceeds rapidly. As Charcot said in 1868, and overnight there is the enormous tumefaction of a member. And one or two weeks later, sometimes much sooner, the existence of more or less marked cracking signs may be noted, betraying the alteration of the articular surfaces, which at this period is already profound. So we have these scenarios of a patient tripping on the ice in winter, coming to casualty, having an X-ray, which essentially looks normal, and then not uh, having specific treatment. And then six weeks later has disruption of the hind foot. And these uh, disruptions lead to uh, hind foot charco deformities, as you can see in this um, slide of a, a 22 year old type one lady who had just uh, tripped over her dog. You can also see deformities in the midfoot developing rapidly. This is the x-ray presentation and you will note there's an increased distance between the base of the first and the second metatarsals. Uh, this was really not noted and then 10 days later a further x-ray was taken and showing uh, a marked Lisfranc uh, dislocation and these lead to the midfoot deformities, the medial convexity you can see here uh, clinically and on the x-ray uh, disruption of the uh, cuneiforms, extrusion of the medial cuneiform, you can see fracture of the second uh, metatarsal, all can develop rapidly. And then of course there's the classical midfoot deformity uh, of the rocker bottom deformity. Now these deformities are obvious and when patients present with this the diagnosis is clear and one proceeds to management. But I want to take you back to the initial stage uh, where diagnosis is extremely important to prevent the progression to uh, the, the need for am amputation. And this is at the hot red uh, swollen foot, the stage naught, which has been added to the Eichenholz uh, classification. And one must have a high index of suspicion. 
A hot red swollen foot should be considered as a Charcot foot until proved otherwise. So how do we prove otherwise or not? What is the approach? Well, the modern approach is to diagnose the Charcot foot when the X-ray is still normal, to detect early abnormalities at this stage naught with modern imaging and with rapid immobilization, keep the X-ray normal and prevent deformity. So how can you make the diagnosis of the active Charcot foot? What are the clues in the history, the examination and the investigations? Well, in the history, there is often a sudden unexplained swelling of the foot. I woke up this morning and cannot get my foot inside my shoe. I was walking along and I suddenly heard a crack and my foot started to swell up. There may be trigger factors as shown in the web-based survey uh, from Framgain in the management of the acute Charcot foot of diabetes with 279 cases. 61.6 had a likely precipitating event within the six months prior to onset. In 34.9%, an accident or previous ulcer. In 10.4%, surgery to the affected foot. And 6.8% uh, osteomyelitis. Regarding trauma, Often there may be no memory of recent trauma. The patient may have been more active than usual or resumed unaccustomed activity after prolonged uh, immobilization, such as a long stay uh, with bed rest. Pain should not rule out the diagnosis of the Charcot foot. It may be present even though the foot is neuropathic and patients often report a general ache or discomfort of the foot. The neuropathy may be so-called minimal. Although the presence of a peripheral neuropathy is crucial to the etiology, on clinical examination neuropathy may be very subtle and there may be only a selective small fibre neuropathy with inability to feel cold or hot. But light touch may be normal and vibration may be normal. And one should be aware of this dissociated sensory loss in young insulin dependent diabetes who have a small fibre neuropathy with a symptomatic autonomic neuropathy but the large nerve fibres are intact. There's usually an associated medial arterial calcification and the Charcot foot. While you're thinking of neuropathy, just be aware that other neuropathies may be associated with Charcot joints. You may be referred as an, to the foot clinic by, with an idiopathic Charcot foot. Then what do you think of? Well, there could be alcoholic neuropathy, a small fibre neuropathy, and then really quite rare conditions, syringomyelia, uh, congenital uh, sensitive, insensitivity to pain, spinal cord injury, uh, leprosy, or dorsalis, uh, tabes dorsalis. So you've got the hot red swollen foot, you've done the history, uh, you've carried out the examination. Uh, are there any investigations which are helpful? What about inflammatory markers in the active, acute Charcot foot? But although there are local signs of inflammation, there is not an equivalent increase in serum inflammatory markers. So in the study from Nina Petrova of 35 patients presenting with acute Charcot foot, you can see that the median C-reactive protein was only 5.8, range 5 to 11, our reference range less than 5, the ESR median was 11, and the white cell count uh, was within normal range. So these are not helpful. So you come to imaging and it's important to make an anatomical diagnosis of the hot red swollen foot. You can look at the hot red swollen foot and say it's a Charcot and then go ahead with treatment. But I think in this day and age, it's important to actually make an anatomical diagnosis. And you've got obviously initially X-ray and then the more modern uh, imaging of MRI, SPECT-CT, 
or CT itself. You do the x-ray and you may get the answer straight away. Again, this is a, a Lisfranc uh, dislocation of the midfoot and you can also see the uh, arterial uh, calcification. But you may have to look a little more closely at an x-ray. Now this is a normal x-ray, uh, AP and oblique views, and look particularly at the alignment between the second metatarsal and the middle cuneiform. And the medial border of the secondary metatarsal lines up with that of the middle cuneiform. And on the oblique view, the lateral border of the second metatarsal lines up with the lateral border of the middle cuneiform. Now, in a patient with early Charcot, early Lis Frank, you can see that the medial border of the secondary metatarsal is not lining up with that of the middle cuneiform. It's cutting th through it. And similarly, on the oblique view, the lateral border uh, line does not line up with the lateral border of the middle cuneiform. So these are clues in the x-ray, which uh, will, will give you a, a possible lead. In the forefoot, uh, the signs are often quite um, minimal, but you will can see uh, a, a yellow arrow, uh, an erosion in the head of the metatarsal, and with the red arrow, a, a lucency. And these can be signs of uh, early Charcot foot. But the x-ray may be completely normal. And then you have to go to other modern imaging techniques. And the one perhaps preferred is the MRI to detect these early abnormalities, particularly the inflammatory sign of the bone marrow edema and also fracture. And this is, is an MRI, uh, T1, STIR and post -scandalinium. And on the, the T1, you can see that there is a fracture line on the medial cuneiform, just below the T1 sign. Uh, and this is accompanied by edema on the stir and inflammation on the post gadolinium. A patient was put into a cast and you can see the resolution of changes, almost healed fracture on T1, resolution of the edema on stir and also resolution of the inflammation on the post gadolinium. And there are various features uh, of the M uh, MRI which help you make the diagnosis. Apart from an early diagnosis, there are other benefits of MRI. It's possible to perform a semi-quantitative scoring to monitor resolution of edema and explore the relationship between Charcot activity and uh, skin temperature. And our group has devised a semi-quantitative scoring proforma uh, uh, the score is naught if there is absence of bone marrow edema on two planes. Score of one when the bone marrow edema is present less than 50%, and a score of two when it's present greater uh, than 50% on two planes. And you can see this uh, in action on the left of the presentation, and you can see. Uh, um, a one score at the base of the first metatarsal, a score of two at the medial cuneiform, a score of naught at the calcaneum, and follow up 12 months casting, you can see that the score has gone to naught in the base of the first metatarsal to one on the medial cuneiform. You can see there's still a bit of edema there and naught on the calcaneum. Measurement of skin temperature is also important in the assessment of the Charcot. And we have this dogma that an active Charcot uh, diagnosis uh, must constitute uh, a greater than two degree centigrade difference between the feet. You can use a single spot infrared or a surface scanning uh, infrared uh, thermometer. Uh, but really, can the active Charcot foot be present with a temperature difference of less than two degrees? Uh, this was a, a study carried out at King's uh, by Jody Lucas of uh, 36 patients with uh, an active Charcot foot and on the, next, the, the line down second line you can see what the contralateral foot in most cases was a non Charcot foot 27 cases uh, it was in an active Charcot in seven cases and an active Charcot on the two in, in actually two cases so we had 27 7 2 uh, um, and when we looked at the temperature rise, temperature difference between the feet, 10 out of 27 in the first group 
uh, had a greater than two degrees temperature of one out of six in the second and not out of two in the third. Uh, and maximum skin temperature difference was 1.6 going along the line 1.9 and 0 0.6. The, the, the bottom line figure is that basically 11 of the patients out of the 36 actives uh, did only had a, a temperature rise of greater than two centigrade uh, degrees. And this uh, is an example. Uh, on the left, you can see an X-ray with um, d disruption of the uh, tarsus again, uh, fractures of the base of the third and fourth metatarsals. Uh, and going on to the right, you can see edema uh, in the um, um, cuneiforms along there, uh, and also in the uh, navicular and the cuboid. But the maximum temperature difference was 1.1. Uh, centigrade degrees. Further imaging is possible uh, with uh, when, when MRI is contraindicated uh, because of pacemaker, metal fragments, claustrophobia, uh, and that is used carried out with a SPEC CT. SPEC, single photon emission commuted tomography. Uh, essentially, it's a 3D bone scan, and you can see uh, the gamma camera there, which rotates around the patient, and then. Uh, a, a CT scan is there also uh, to, to carry out a 3D x-ray as it were uh, and in the procedure one gets a, a planar 2D scan, a spec scan, CT scan and fusion of the images. So this is the, the, the classical 2D scan. Uh, the top line is the early blood pool, uh, the bottom line is the 4-hour image and you can see a hot spot increased activity in the left uh, hind foot area. You then uh, do the 3D bone scan, the, the camera uh, whizzes around the foot uh, to take views and once seen this increased hot spot in the hind foot, CT scans are taken to look at this area and then there's a fusion of image of the CT and the, and the uh, spect and you can see uh, very closely if you look a little fracture line in the uh, lower end of the talus uh, and this is circled here you can see that fracture line and that uh, fracture needs immobilization or it could lead to a shock up. and finally there's the uh, you, you may argue well why not just do a CT it may pick up cyst erosions fracture or dislocation it won't pick up the inflammatory changes such as bone marrow uh, edema as such but if you do the x-ray and see look at the first metatarsal and the, and, the, and the medial cuneiform you can see the cystic lesions there uh, and also on the lateral you can also see a cystic lesion and fragmentation uh, which is also uh, indicative of, of, of a Charcot foot. Uh, looking at that uh, cystic and erosion it makes you think well are there other, other common pathologies? So as you come to make your final uh, diagnosis, you've got to exclude the common pathologies which figure in the differential diagnosis. Uh, you, uh, is it gout? Well, the serum uric acid would be high and uric crystals would be present in the joint fluid. Uh, are you missing a cellulitis? Is it that rather than Charcot? Cellulitis is more likely in the presence of an ulcer and of course the CRP is usually high, usually greater than 50. In the active acute shark, C-reactive protein is within the normal range in almost 50% and only moderately elevated in the remainder. There is a lot of edema in Charcot and one must be careful not to mistake it for a deep vein thrombosis uh, and if one's uncertain then a duplex deep vein uh, will give confirmation or otherwise. So, in conclusion, uh, the modern approach is to diagnose the Charcot foot when the x-ray is still normal. And with rapid intervention, keep it normal. Uh, I'm uh, willing to, to, to take uh, uh, questions through email if possible, although I think the questions are going to a, a central source. Well, thank you for listening uh, for, to me. and. Uh, uh, I, I, I hope that you are having a good uh, Charcot symposium. I'm sorry not to be there. Thank you.